Welcome to another sermon from the Lewis Church of Christ. The sermon series for the month of June is called Post-it Notes. Each sermon is based on one-liners from the Apostle Paul. And now, here's Mark. We are going to wrap up today our sermon series for the month of June. Uh, The sermon series has been called Post-it Notes. Post-it Notes. In this series, we've been looking at one-liners from the Apostle Paul that we can't afford to forget. One-liners from, you know, the Word of God that, may, that maybe we ought to take and write on a few post-it notes and put it up in different places so that we don't, we don't forget what it says. The post-it note message I have for you today is a little tough. Um, I have a feeling that you're going to be tempted to complain about today's post-it note message but I have a feeling none of you will fall prey to that sin. Because the post-it note message is this, Philippians 2.14, do everything without grumbling or arguing. Philippians 2.14, now don't you wish all the kids were in here for this one? Do everything without grumbling or arguing. One translation says it this way, do everything without arguing and quit just talking about wishing you didn't have to do it. I kind of like that one. Do everything without grumbling or arguing. One translation just simply puts it this way, do everything without complaining. Do everything without complaining. I understand there was a gentleman one time and his heart's desire was to be a monk. So he decided he was going to go to a monastery and he was going to find out, you know, how he could join. So he gets there, he gets to the monastery and he, and he meets the head monk and he asks the head monk, hey, what do I need to do to join? And the head monk said, well, it's a little more difficult than you are, are thinking, I have a feeling. He goes, try me. He says, well, at this monastery, if you join, if you join this monastery, uh, you're only allowed to speak two words in a year's time. And the guy responded, well, that, that sounds a little bit extreme, but I've always wanted to be a monk. I'm going to give it a try. So the head monk takes him to his room, shows him his room, and he stays there for the next 12 months in total silence. At the, end of, uh, at the end of the year, he's brought in and meets with the head monk, and the head monk gives him permission to speak his two words. And the guy just said, food's bad. <laughs> Goes back to his room, he spends another 12 months in silence. At the end of his second year, he comes in, he has a conversation with the head monk, and the head monk gives him permission. Hey, <clears throat> you can now speak your two words. Bed's hard. He goes back to the room, spends another 12 months in silence. At the, end of it, at the end of his third year, he comes in, he talks to the head monk, and before the head monk even gives him permission, gives the two words, the guy just exclaims, I quit! And the monk responded, no surprise there, I've done nothing but complain the whole time you've been here. Do everything without complaining. It's kind of like the dad. He took his family to church and he got to church and, you know, experienced the whole church service. And then on his way home, he's in the vehicle on his way home with his family and, he, and he's doing nothing but complaining. The music was too loud. The sermon was too long. The people weren't friendly. It was too hot in the building. The announcements were unclear. I didn't know if I need to go across or, or make a way north. Everything. He just complained, 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 complained about everything. And finally, son said from the back, say, Dad, it really wasn't that bad for just a buck. I mean, you only gave a dollar. <laughs> it is the first service. I'll give you a little slack. <laughs> well, not bad for, a, for just a dollar, right? Do everything. Someone said, someone said, it's not the verses in the Bible 
that I don't understand that troubles me. It's the verses in the Bible that I do understand that trouble me. Isn't that true? Isn't that true? And I know for a fact, every one of you understand this verse. And you and I, as followers of Jesus, the expectation is that you and I would never gripe or bellyache or whine or complain or moan or groan, uh, groan or grumble. We understand that verse. Do everything without complaining. And we understand that that means, you know, we need to go to work without complaining. We need to serve without complaining. We need to go without complaining. We understand. But you know why that bothers us? On occasion, we like to complain. But the truth is, we really don't have much to complain about. Do everything without complaining. I want you to understand, first of all, that this is first a command to obey. It is a command to obey. And the reason why the Lord really wants us to obey this command is, is the fact that it, the God hates complaining. He hates it. The Israelites from the Old Testament were infamous for their complaining, were they not? I mean, from the beginning of time, we've been complainers. One comedian quipped, on the seventh day, God rested. On the eighth day, he started answering complaints. Yeah, it's pretty much true. Remember Adam in the Garden of Eden? I mean, immediately. God, it was... It was the woman you gave me, right? And then the snake, the devil made me do it, right? And then, and then Cain just, my brother's so annoying. I just complain, complain, complain. Um, remember the Exodus? The Exodus. Moses led the people out of Egypt and had no, go back. Don't, Margie, wait for me, wait for me. Don't, don't give the punchline. Hey, day in the morning. All right, it's only first service. I'm going to cut a little slack. Thank you, Lord, for peripheral. Anyway, the Israelites, they were infamous for, for complaining. Just, they exited out of Egypt. Uh, they're, they're rescued in a dynamic, powerful way to escape slavery from the Egyptians. Remember the crossing of the Red Sea? Incredible. They go out, they worship God, and a tremendous celebration of just being saved from slavery. <clears throat> Three days later, we don't like the water. It's a little bitter. Is there sulfur in that water? And then and the Lord provides them sweet water. We don't have enough to eat. We used to have all kinds of good food back in Egypt. We don't have enough to eat. And God provided manna, you know, food of angels. Manna would supply every, all of their nutritional needs, the manna. But the manna is so bland. That's all we get is manna. You know, we need some meat. Where's the beef? And God provides quail. and I mean, over and over and over. In fact, they literally, I want you to look at what they literally said. Uh, in Exodus chapter 14. Margie? I love you, sister. <laughs> I repent. I repent. They said to Moses... Was it because there were, were no graves in Egypt that you brought us out to the desert to die? Oh. What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone. Let us serve the Egyptians. We love to be slaves. 
It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. You know what? I am, I am really surprised that lightning just didn't... Now, I say that because look what happened. Look, at the, look what happened in Numbers chapter 11. Look at this. Margie. I just had a flashback, Margie, of you standing. You were standing, you know, at the security office in Canada. You know, just, anyway. Now the people complained. Listen, the com- people complained about their hardships in the hearing of the Lord. And when he heard them, his anger aroused. Then fire from the Lord burned among them and consumed some of them on the outs- outskirts of camp. God hates complaining. And do you remember when they sent the 12 spies into the promised land to explore it all out and to see what they were about to receive as a, as a reward and a promise from God? Remember that? Ten of them came back and they were complaining and grumbling. And they were like, Oh man, it was beautiful, but we can't have it. We can't take the land. They're too big. They're too powerful. There are giants in the land. We're too scared. We're like grasshoppers in their eyes. And you know what God said? Fine, you don't get it. And they wandered around in the desert for 40 years until they died. God hates complaining. Remember the story of Korah? Korah was part of their church. But Korah had a little preacher in him. He didn't like what was going on. He didn't like the leadership. He kept talking bad about the church, kept talking bad about the leaders. He had his little people group. Hey, won't you come meet with us so we can talk about what they're doing wrong? He formed a coup. 250 men started to follow him. And right before they were to make their move to take out Moses, (laughs) this is awesome. God opened up the ground, swallowed, swallowed Korah and all of his 250 followers, closed it back up, they went on in peace. Praise the Lord. And it was a huge illustration just to say, God hates complaints. It's a command to obey. I want you also to know that complaining is a confession of your heart. And complaining is a confession of your heart that basically tells us the Lord is nowhere near it. In fact, when you are complaining, it is a, is a sign that you've actually turned your heart against the Lord. It's confession. That you're not really close to him. Um, in my family, in the McGee family, on occasion, uh, I have found myself saying to my children, to something like this, uh, McGee's don't use that word. Uh, McGee's don't do that. McGee's don't go to places like that. McGee's don't have jobs like that. McGee's don't do this. McGee's don't do that. McGee, you know, and I'm trying to develop this, this in them. Because we don't, we don't do that. But because when you confess, you're turning your heart against the Lord. I thought it was interesting that, uh, can you go back to our um, uh, post-it note? These two words for grumbling and arguing are interesting words. The word grumbling there is uh, gongosmuts. What? Yeah, Gongosmith. Uh, it's a onomatopoeic word, and it means it means like it sounds. Gongosmith. Gongosmith. And, and it really is not necessarily a word. It's more of an expression of dissatisfaction, and it's kind of a low murmuring under underneath your breath. Gongosmith. Gongosmith. You know that type of thing. And you know what I'm saying? Just under your breath. Rubble, rubble, rubble. You know, that just, that's what it means. That's what the word is. It's kind of a low expression, a grumbling inside based on a dissatisfaction. 
And you know how the Lord interprets. He's interpreting it as you're saying. God. You're not being very good to me. It comes from an attitude. It's really a dig against God. It's a curse against God. It's a dig against him saying. It comes from a selfish mindset. That says I'm not getting God. You're not giving me what I want. And I deserve better than this. Can you get an idea of why he hates complaining? But the first word is. The second word is the word uh, dialogismus. Or, uh, it's from the word we get dialogue. And, and the word really means a, an inner reasoning. Uh, an intellectual conversation that I'm having within myself but with God. And basically, you're trying to tell God in, in an intellectual fashion that you don't really agree with what's happening in your life. You don't really like what's happening in your life. And so you're having this argument with God. Can you see why God hates complaining? So, you know, it's, it's command to obey. It's confession of the heart. I, I want you to know that... That complaining is a cancer. That needs to be cut out now. I mean, if you go to the doctor this week and find out that you have cancer in your system, do you want to wait two years to see how it, ha what, how it grows in the next two years? You find out you have cancer in your system, what? You want it out now, right? Yeah, complaining is a cancer in the church. And, and it's a cancer that is so contentious and so contagious. Public enemy number one within the church? Complaining. And we've got to cut it out. Just stop. Just stop. I also want you to understand today that this n no complaining is really a character that we need to develop. It's just a character. It takes time to develop, but we need to develop. That's why from time to time I go to my kids and, I, hey, McGee's don't do that. McGee's don't do that. I want you to hear today that Followers of Jesus. I mean, the, the people who really trust in Jesus, uh, we don't complain. Followers of Christ don't complain. It's a ca character. It, it's a character to develop. The cure is really simple. If you're uh, here this morning and honestly, you know, you know, I'm guilty of complaining. I'm a complainer. I mean, you can, spot, you can spot a complainer a mile away, right? If you, if you would confess today that you're one of those, you're a complainer, I want to suggest to you that the cure is pretty simple. The cure is to develop a heart of gratitude. A heart of gratitude. Look at this. Um, 1 Thessalonians 5, uh, 16, 17, and 18 uh, says this. Rejoice always. Now, that was our first post-it note, if you remember. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. I hear a lot of people, I just want to know God's will for my life. I just want to do God's will for my life. Well, there it is. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. The cure is pretty simple. Um, in the book, Springs in the Valley, the writer tells a story of a man who happens upon a big barn. And inside the barn were all these seeds that Satan likes to plant in human hearts. Seeds, the, the complaining seeds, the seeds of complaining were numerous. I mean, you know, more than any other seed in there were the seeds of complaining. And the, and the devil went on to explain to this man that I can get these seeds of complaining to grow just about anywhere. But when questioned about that, the devil was a little bit reluctant to kind of tell the truth on this. And he said... There's actually one place I can't get any seeds to grow. And the man said, well, where is that? Where can't you get any of these complaint seeds to grow? 
And the devil sadly and hesitantly responded in a heart that's full of thanks. I would love for your response right now to be, I'm done with complaining, and I'm going to start thanking. No more complaining and full of gratitude. I I would love for you to have that response today as you leave this place. No more complaining. Forward with thanksgiving. Wouldn't that be good? I want to do do an exercise with you today. Um, I'd love to have every one of you stand with me right now. Would you just stand? Love for every one of you to stand. And as you stand today, um, I want to share a list with you, a list of things that are true of you because you have said yes to Jesus. And as I share this list with you, uh, I, you know, I'm t- I've kind of simplified them. As I share the list, And as I say the phrase, I would love for you to repeat it out loud. So today, if you are in Christ, I would love for you to repeat this list out loud back at me. All right? Let's try this. John John 1.12 says, I am God's child. child. Yes, you are. A child of God. John 15, 15, I am Christ's friend. Romans 5, 1, I have been justified. Now, some of you don't even know what that word means. and You just said it. The word justified means just as if I'd never sinned. Get that? Justified, just as if I'd never sinned. Let's do that one again. I am justified. That's a great one. 1 Corinthians 6, 17, I am united with Christ. Man, Romans 6 tells us that when we come out of that baptistry, we are united with Christ. Joan, we are united with Christ. Ooh, that's awesome. 1 Corinthians 6, 20, I have been bought with a price. 1 Corinthians 12, 20, I am a member of Christ's body. Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, I am a saint. Some of you are like, I am a... Hey, don't argue with me. You can argue with Apostle Paul if you want, but that's what he calls us. I am a saint. Ooh. Wow. How about this one? Ephesians 1, 1.5, I, I am adopted as God's child. Ephesians 2, 18, I have direct as- access to God. Wow, that's a great one. Wow. Colossians 1, 14, I have been redeemed. Colossians 1, 14, I have been forgiven of all my sins. Colossians 2, 10, I am complete in Christ. Romans 8, 1, I am free from condemnation. Romans 8.35, I cannot be separated from the love of God. Philippians 3.20, I am a citizen of heaven. Colossians 3.3, I am hidden with Christ in God. What does that mean? Well, you can look that up later, but it's true. It's true. 1 Peter 2.9, I am chosen by God. Chosen. Chosen chosen by God. Wow. How about this one? Ephesians 2, 6. I am seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. Some of you are like, no, actually, I'm standing here at the crossing. Ephesians 2, 10. I am God's masterpiece. Can we do that one again? You forgot about some of those things, didn't you? What in the world do we have to complain about? Absolutely not. 
do everything. Everything. Without complaint. This has been a presentation of the Lewis Church of Christ. We are located at 15183 Coastal Highway, Milton, Delaware, three miles north of Lewis on Highway 1. Our service times are 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. every Sunday morning.